today and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely to see all of you and we, we appreciate everyone joining us online we, we challenge you this morning to praise the name of the Lord no matter what your circumstance your situation what's going on in your life good bad or ugly or pretty praise the name of God today come on
us to diminish so you can increase, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're all that you do. I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified. see you, God. We need to see your face. More of you, less of me. Be magnified. Be glorified. 
Father God, we surrender. We give you everything, our hopes, our dreams. We give you our failures, our successes. We give it all to you. We give you our families. We give you our jobs. We give you our income. We give it all to you, Father. Be in every facet of our life, Lord Jesus. Take control. Let it be you that they seek, not us. As we lift you up and glorify your name, God, we praise you from the bottom of our hearts today. In Jesus' name. But I'm going to leave you the option if there's another neighbor that you'd like to say hi to as you take your seats, that's fine. Well, again, welcome this morning. My name is Matt. I'm one of the board members here at Capital Church. Um, and as those that have been here, we know that the Connect cards are in the seats, but if you're a guest with us, we'd really appreciate you taking the time to fill that out um, and drop it off at our Connect Center in the back corner. We have a free gift for you just to get to know you, just to kind of find out a little information about you, and if you have any questions for us, we'd love to have that opportunity to share that with you. Um, if you're a regular attender, you can use the other side of that card for any of the questions that you have, if there's other next steps that you'd like to take, any of those type things either drop them off the Connect Center also or put them in the giving stations in the back. That would be a, that would be great. So October has been Pastor Appreciation Month. And so uh, today we're going to do uh, Pastor Leon. So we have a short montage of videos that we're going to have you watch at this point. Good morning, Pastor Leon. The first day that Holly and I attended Capitol Church, we were greeted by you downstairs. And I have to tell you, there was an immediate connection because you were so welcoming and warm and you had this infectious smile and laugh and you were very humble. And uh, after we spent a few weeks to months and now years being here, that is so you. That's just, you are honest and true to the core. And I've realized that you just love people so genuinely and that is because of the love of Christ in you and uh, I am just so honored to call you my pastor and more importantly my brother and uh, I look forward to many more years of working side by side with you and just being able to enjoy the journey together so God bless you love your brother Hi, Pastor Leon. So I was asked to say thank you to you uh, to say how much that I love you. And that was really easy. And I'm actually doing it with no makeup on. That's how much I love you and care about you. I just have to tell you that one of the things that meant a ton to me is that you told me I was one of your favorite people. And that day, just, I needed that. And um, I just love you. I love your heart. I love how caring you are. I love how when I come to church, you're just right there for a hug or a smile. And you're just a wonderful human being. And I always know that you're there for me. So I love you, I appreciate you, I'm so thankful that you're in my life, and I cherish the fact that you are a pastor here. So thank you, thank you so much for being here and for your kindness. A few years ago, I signed up for Learning to Follow Jesus. I was paired up with a man named Leon. He was very friendly, very nice, very receptive, and very patient, especially working with me. One of the things that I was working on was how to surrender to God. That has been my goal ever since, is to completely surrender to God, because I see through now Pastor Leon how to do it. He's shown me the path of where it could take you to. And I want to be there someday. So thank you, Leon. We love you. And thank you so much for being part of Capital Church.
Tracy and Lee, enough of you to join me up here. It's the only way I could get Nick in a video. <coughs> and he did a great job, him and Brian together. But. So we did this first service, and as I was kind of going through my crew of people and asking you how it went, I was told that the light is very similar for Pastor Jason's, because our shine off our head is about the same. <laughs> so hopefully we're not blinding any of you out there with this much up sage. But <coughs> anyway, that had nothing to do with his appreciation for it. Other than the fact that, as you can see, he's a role model for me because we dress in the same colors, we have the hair hairstyle. Um, but as most of those videos had stated, if you've been in growth track in the last couple of years or if you've just been in small groups or anything with Leon, you understand what that means to have someone that has God's heart and, and service and, and willing to share that with us. And we appreciate that. And just like Marty, Leon was my mentor through the, the spiritual growth. And it was just the time not only just to continue my walk as a Christian, but also just to develop that friendship. And so when I was asked to do this, I said, the one I'm taking is Leon because he's the choice that I have the closest bond with. And uh, I, I appreciate him and Tracy and just the service that they do for this church to the point of even when they've uh, went beyond and pastor went back and started, you know, going through the training to be a, a full-time pastor and stuff like that. We appreciate the effort that he puts in for all of that. But we know that his friendship is genuine and his uh, growth. And as we watch that and as we grow and follow what he does as, as he makes disciples and with us, we just appreciate that so much. And so I'm going to say a short prayer, and I'd just have, love to have you guys join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you today, especially for Leon. We know his heart. We see it lived out in his life. We ask that you would just bless his um, continued education and wherever you take him. We appreciate his time here with us and just his dedication and service to you at, our, at Capital Church. We just ask a, a blessing, especially over their family, this week and at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. I'm going to hug you this time. Just in case you're wondering, Leon's not feeling that great, so he may not hug you, don't feel offended. I told him I didn't care. So um, we're going to watch Capital News. <laughs> follow a routine. We eat, we work, we relax, repeat. Many of us desire to make a difference, but we don't know how. What if there was one day that was a little different than the rest? Maybe our routine is the same, but the purpose changes. A day where every action has a deeper impact. Each stroke on a keyboard or minute in a meeting translates into differences being made all over the globe. One Day to Feed the World does exactly that. When you give one day of your salary to Convoy of Hope, every action you do that day translates into momentum. Momentum to make a greater impact. Through children's feeding programs, agricultural training, women's empowerment initiatives, and disaster relief, Convoy of Hope is making an enormous impact around the world. We may not have equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. No one person can do everything, but everyone can do something that's the power of one. One day to feed the world. Hey, Capital Church. It's Emily from the Board of Directors. Just wanted to send you a quick reminder to let you know we have two weeks left in our Pastor Appreciation Month. This is just a time where we want to take some extra strides and efforts to tell our pastors how much we love and appreciate all that they do for us behind the scenes. If you haven't already, we have boxes in the back of the sanctuary. Feel free to drop a note or a gift, whatever your heart leads you to do, just to show you our appreciation for our pastors. Thanks again for joining us to make this an extra special time.
ever wondered about Capital Church and kind of what we're all about? Have you even considered maybe membership or, or maybe you're even checking out Christianity for the first time? Well, we want to provide an opportunity to, to travel together and kind of answer those questions. Uh, next week on Sunday after each service, we're going to have what we call the growth track meet and greet. And what that does, it provides an opportunity for us to get to know each other, learn more about the needs that you may have, and answer some of those questions that you might have as well. So once again, next Sunday after each service, over above our food pantry in the building next door, we'll meet for Growth Track. Can't wait to see you there. Why do we give? We give to make a difference, to touch hearts and change lives. We give to feed the hungry, care for the sick, and comfort those in need. We give to show Jesus to our neighbors, our community, and the world. We give as an act of worship to a God who has given everything. We give because we are the church, the body of Christ, called to be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, sharing the hope of the gospel. This is why we give. Well, this morning is going to be an extra special morning, kind of a, a unique morning that really we are going to have to roll up our sleeves. And if you've got your seatbelt with you, go ahead and buckle your seatbelt. <clears throat> this morning, we're going to be talking about miracles and tithing. And I kind of paraphrase one of my favorite candies. It's two great tastes that taste great together. This morning, we're going to look back, back on June 4th as a congregation, our voting membership. We, we gathered together here in our special business meeting uh, to pray through uh, if it's God's voice for us to relocate. And I promised you two things on that Sunday. I promised you either way, we can still be friends. And I promised you either way, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and we would have some work before us. Now, the board has been working hard behind the scenes in prayerful preparation for the transition. We've been working with the banks, working with contractors, working with both townships, uh, meeting with many churches and nonprofit leaders, kind of what would be the best suitable option for our current campus. But through it all, you have also been rolling up your sleeves. You have been sharing the load. Several times we've had groups that have gone over and held meetings at the new campus, uh, praying through or dreaming about what God might have for us in the future. You've been giving us valuable feedback, valuable insights, really helping to guide and to shape us throughout this process and helping to make decisions. You have been critical in fighting to protect the unity of God's church. You've been in prayer. And God has been answering those prayers uh, and continues to show his favor each step of the way. And super critically, you have been faithful in your tithes and your offerings. And I can't overstate just how important that is. I mean, when uh, banks are looking at our, our kind of our, our, our worthiness for, for, for loans, uh, they're looking at your record of, of giving, not like yours individually, but yours as a church, and they're looking at that. And so really, quite literally, your faithfulness in giving will influence and impact those terms of, of, our, of our loan going forward. But more than just the banks, it's our ministries. All of this is possible because of your faithfulness in giving, your faithfulness in supporting uh, your work behind the scenes, your preparation, your prayer for what God has in store for us. I can't overstate just how important what you do is. Your faithfulness enables the ministry that we do to continue to touch lives. Like, for example, Friday night. How many were here on Friday night? 
All right, you got a little bit of a taste, of what I would call it, uh, controlled chaos, or maybe just straight chaos, would not be possible without your support of Pastor Lidjo and Capital Kids, with your support of Pastor Jennifer and the School Age Care Ministry. What you do, your support, helps us to be able to reach those families, for us to once again reach out to St. Catherine's, to welcome their students here, and to be loved on by this church family. You were a part of giving that tangible love of Christ. Now, we, we were anticipating 75, maybe on the high end, 100. I know at one point, we counted, we had about 250 in the building at one point. How many came through the night? I've heard estimates from 300 to 400. Someone said 500. I don't know. We had a lot of kids. There was someone this morning in the hallway talking about having 1,000 people. I, I don't know, but we'll just go that. We had thousands of people here. <laughs> But easily hundreds. I mean, those of you who are here, you know it was just a unique opportunity. These are people that we prayerfully invited in. And we had an opportunity to show them the love of Christ, just to meet them where they are at for a fun evening in the church. And none of that would be possible without you. And what you do to continue the work, the ministry of our church. It's only possible, and I mean it is only possible with your faithfulness, with your consistent in, in your obedience to the word of God and God's command to return that first portion of what you earn to him in your tithe. And so this Sunday, once again, I'm going to don the CRO hat, the chief reminding officer, and, and just once again kind of walk through some things Things that you already know, things we've already talked about in the Bible. There are more than 500 verses concerning prayer and nearly 500 verses concerning faith. That's about like, like one verse for every child that was in the building on Friday night. But there are more than 2,000 verses on the subject of money and possessions. Jesus talked about money in 16 of his 38 parables. Now, when you think about that, let that sink in. Nearly a third, 30% of Jesus' teaching during his ministry was on money. Three years of public ministry, and he spent about a third of it just talking about our finances. Now, we're going to get to the miracles but the miracles are only possible after our faith and our faithfulness. A verse that we're all familiar with, you've heard it before, Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. It's not the first time that most of us have heard that verse, read that verse. We understand and we know this verse. And when we take a step back, we know what God is saying here. Because when God says to test me, he is saying, trust me, don't doubt me. God is saying, you can test me because I want you to trust me. God is saying, I want you to not doubt me. I want you to Trust me. As a father, I, I, our kids growing up, like I know I want my kids to trust me, to take me at my word. I don't want them to doubt me, whether it's when they were young, jumping off the edge of the pool. Trust me, I'm going to catch you. Or if there's something that they're walking through, trust me. I don't want them to doubt me. And God is saying very specifically, test me because I want you to trust me. And not doubt me. That's why for the past two years we've offered here a 90-day tithe challenge. Very simple for those who have, have never tithed. Just simply an opportunity to give you an invitation, a, a no-risk invitation to test God at his word. 
All this, is inf- all this information, is, it's right on our website. It's been there for the past two years, simple as this. Uh, if you've never tithed before, go ahead and, and begin to tithe over the next 90 days. And after 90 days of your faithful tithe, if God has not kept up his end of the promise, then we'll return to you, we'll refund to you 100% of your tithe for those 90 days. Now, we've been offering this here for the past two years and our previous church, basically the past decade or so, the churches that I've led, we've offered this. And I'll tell you today that not a single individual, not a single family has come back to ask for their money back. And again, no questions asked. Go ahead and register, submit, go ahead and, and tithe. And if at the end of the 90 days God hasn't kept his promise, we'll return it all to you. And and part of the reason why no one's needed to ask it back is because when God is making the promise, it's a guarantee. That's why it's so easy for us to offer this, because we know that God will stand by his word. God will stand by his promises. And he knows that those who have tested him will come to know that he's trustworthy. We don't need to doubt him. So, so that we can test him, so that we can trust him. Pastor and author Robert Morris put it this way. I think I shared it with you before. Clearly from the Bible's standpoint, we need to understand money and how to handle it. Why? Because money is actually a test from God. When we view money as how God views money, how God intends for us to view money, then we begin to see miraculous things happening and God pouring out his blessings upon our lives. Quick recap again, some things we've already looked at before, the straight up things that the Bible teaches us. One, tithing isn't really giving, it's returning. We're simply returning back to God that tithe, that first portion of what he has blessed us with. The tithe is 10%. The tithe is the first 10%. The tithe is the best first 10%. We looked at several of these scriptures before, including Exodus 23. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. And we all say, like, we all say and, and, and believe that we want God's best for our lives. We want God's best for our family. We want God's best for our church, God's best for our community, right? I mean, quick show of hands. How many of you want God's blessings on your life? All right. How many of you want God's protection on your life? All right. Finally, how many of us want to be in God's will? All right, about the same percentage as first service, <laughs> just about everybody. And I can't see those hands at home, but I'm pretty sure you want God's blessings, protection, and to be in his will as well. But I've learned a long time ago that we have to follow his commands for our lives. Learned some of this kind of the hard way growing up. Uh, My parents had had a rule. I think I shared this with some of you before that uh, when I wanted to to drive, I needed to get a driver's license. All right. That's kind of like, that's kind of a given. Um, Needed to have car insurance, my own car insurance. Uh, I needed to have AAA and I needed to have my own car. Like these were non-negotiables from my my parents if I wanted to, to drive. And so sure enough, I got my license. I got AAA. I had insurance. I had a car. And driving home one night after youth group, I probably had my license maybe just for a few months at this point. I'm at an intersection, and one of the the few car accidents that I can say was completely not my fault. And this one, I get hit, I get T-bone, and totals my car. But in that moment, I I had my seatbelt on. I was following the law. I had my seatbelt on, and I had AAA so I could get the car towed. And I had insurance so I could get paid after the car was uh, totaled. I bought the car for my brother, my older brother, who did not have his driver's license yet, bought the car for a case of Mountain Dew. (laughs) Got into a car accident. I got a check for 500 bucks. And at the time, that really seemed like a sweet deal, 
from a case of Mountain Dew to 500 bucks. But only because I was following my parents' command. And I had learned why they had these rules. It's because of my oldest brother, Chris. He borrowed the family car, not his own car. This is the last time that a child was allowed to drive a parent's car. Two-tone blue Ford Escort, four-speed, no air conditioning. Parents never had air conditioning growing up in our car. And he was driving with one of his friends, and he rolled the car, flipped it three times, totaling it. No seatbelts. He didn't have his own insurance, and he didn't have AAA to come and bail him out. And it was because of that, my parents had these rules, and it was because of that that I came to learn that my parents had these rules to protect me. My parents had these rules to provide for me. Quite honestly, my parents set these rules to take care of me. My parents' instructions and restrictions were there for my benefit. Because they loved me and they wanted what was best for me. Okay, gonna buckle up for this one. See what I did there? Gonna kind of get, all right. God doesn't need you to give, but you need to be blessed. He doesn't need your money, He doesn't need your time, He doesn't need you to give. You need his blessings. Time and time again, I've seen it. Time and time again, I have experienced it. God using his biblical principles to answer our prayers when it comes to finances. And that's why it's so easy, again, as a church, to stand behind a 90-day tithe challenge. That is why we invite you to partner with God in your missions offerings, missions pledges twice a year. And it's why it's so easy for us to give you opportunities to choose to trust him with your finances. Because God's after your heart. He loves you. Not what you give. He loves you. Back in the day when we passed the offering plate, he wasn't looking at what you were putting in. He was looking at you. Even now, the giving stations or, or giving online he sent his son for you, not for your offering, not for your tithe, not for what you could give him, but he was looking for you. We give out of obedience. We give out of generosity, not greed. God blesses those who give but not those who give just to get. And I've shared before that I struggled with understanding this one when I was younger, properly understanding. I had read God's promises, and I wanted God's blessings, so I knew I could give, and I would expect that he would return. But all the while, he just truly wanted my heart. I had a great conversation with our kids about tithing a few weeks ago, and and uh, middle daughter was just sharing, like, how grateful she is that as far back as she can remember, she's always been tithing. And so it was just kind of something that she's always done. And so now that she's earning more and, and working more, it's just that much easier. It's something that she already knows and she's already been witnessing God being faithful, answering his promises, standing by his word. Robert Morris again shared, generosity doesn't give to receive. Generosity is always rewarded by God. He continues, if you give, God is going to bless you. No power on earth is going to stop it. Sorry if that bothers you. You're just going to have to deal with it. That's just the way that God works. It's his principle. Back on the, the Connect Center, there's a few copies of the book, Circle Maker. I had ordered those kind of in preparation for the series. And, and I had ordered it anticipating kind of sharing maybe some anecdotes or some examples and stories uh, from the, the book, really, to kind of parallel what we're walking through 
uh, as a church. Um, but actually, the Lord's going to lead me in a little bit of a different direction today. And so uh, for those who might not be familiar with the book or maybe just need a, a quick reminder again, I'll don the CRO hat as a chief reminding officer. Um, circle Maker, based upon the, the story of Honey, the Circle Maker, Israel was going through a, series, a, a season of drought, and they called upon Honey to pray for rain. And as he stood there, he used his staff, and he drew a circle, and he prayed for God's rain. He said, I will not leave this circle until you send rain. And at first, it was just a really soft rain. And he said, not for such rain have I prayed. And he stayed in that circle and praying, and God sent a torrential heavy downpour. Again, not for such rain have I prayed. And he continued to believe God, standing in that circle, praying for rain until God Brent uh, sent just a sustaining, nourishing rain upon the ground. Based upon that story, Mark Batterson in his book, uh, really it's a life-changing book on the power of prayer and some of the biblical principles of prayer and some powerful testimonies of a small church in the capital district of D.C., and how God miraculously provided and honored their faith time and time again. My wife and I used to pastor not too far from, from Mark's church. While we were meeting in a movie theater in Annapolis, he was just down Route 50 at a movie theater in Washington, D.C., uh, at a movie theater in Union Station. I remember the day that their theater church made the front page of the newspaper. I also remember the day that the theater... Uh, announced that they were closing that week. And they had to scramble to find a place to meet for Sunday. Now, fast forward a few years, a few circles that have been prayed, a few miraculous answers to prayer, and now National Community Church is the largest private land owner on Capitol Hill. And it all boils down to a few simple truth. They prayerfully sought the Lord and then they boldly followed his voice. But they were also faithful with their tithe and their mission support. Mark Batterson shares one of those stories, one of those early stories of taking that faithful obedience personally and as a church and what God did with that faithful Obedience, again, highly recommend you pick up a copy and allow God to speak to you through. I shared a, an article online just the, just the other day of, an, of another church that miraculously retired $2.8 million uh, of their mortgage, and they gave the credit to those same principles. They were faithful in their tithe, but they were also faithful in supporting their missionaries. Another pastor once taught me, you reap what you sow. You reap after you sow, and you reap more than you sow. Kind of makes sense that the farmers are amongst us, but this is really how it works. This is God's principles of sowing and reaping. What you put in is what you're going to get out, but you have to put it in first. And what you put in will come back multiplied. So again, I implore you to add the circle maker to your reading list. I might even say, uh, I need you to. Why? Because we are walking into some exciting seasons of growth and change, and I need every one of us to have every tool available to be at our sharpest. God is answering prayers. God is performing miracles on a scale that personally I've never handled before as a lead pastor. And as I've said a hundred times before easily, I can't do this on my own. It can't just be me sitting in my office, hearing from God, and then telling you what God said. We need to be hearing from God. We need to be seeking his voice. We need God to guide us and to direct us as a church unified seeking God's voice and God's will. We need to roll up our sleeves, drop to our knees in prayer. Because where we're going, none of us have gone before. 
on Monday nights uh, for our community group. I, have a, I lead the discovery group, uh, and we meet on Monday nights over at the new campus. And I've shared with them that, that we are building the new church. Not with brick and mortar like, like those whose shoulders we stand upon today. Like where we stand today, there have been those who have gone before us over these past hundred plus years that have physically built churches that we have met in in the past and where we are meeting in today. Now, moving forward, we don't have to lay the brick and build the building in the same way that those before us did, but we need to build it in just another way creating the DNA, really assessing God, guide us and direct us. Who are we going to be as a church? God's been guiding us. Saying, hey, there is work to be done ahead. And even if we get the smartest group of people in the room, it doesn't amount to anything. If it's not God who's building the house. If it's not God who is guiding, if it's not God who is speaking. Just a quick summary of where we've been over these past few months. Going back a, a year or two ago, as the Maywood building became available, we began to pray as a board, like, might this be? Might this be where God has for us? At that point, we'd already looked at uh, so many other buildings and property and land and, and options and and we, we walk through with the board and some of the elders and some of the staff. And, and we, we walk through and kind of praying, God, might this be what you have for us? A gigantic facility and certainly a, a lot of work to be able to shift it into a church. But God, is this what you have? And, and we just began to take steps of faith as God would guide us. One step at a time. And I was transparent with the board. I, I don't see the whole staircase. I don't see everywhere where we're going. But as God speaks to us, we're going to take one step at a time by faith. And God's been guiding and directing. And even when we thought the doors were closed there, we, we began to pray where, God, pray where God might have for us. And there was just one of those kind of fateful conversations. You know, the Martin Harding Mazzotti building had been on the market three, three and a half million dollars. Uh, we weren't even really considering just because of the price, but the Holy Spirit just, just kind of spoke to one of our board members just to, just to call because of a, a business connection. Hey, let, let's, just, let's just call and let's just see. And the owner became excited, the possibility of a, a Christian church coming in. And we saw that price just quickly begin to drop for us. God already showing us his favor. And even as others were interested in the building, we, we, we kind of found ourselves, kind of, a bit of a spoiler alert for those who have not yet read The Circle Maker, uh, that even as others were interested, it was the church, it was the underdog that ended up getting the acceptance for the property. Now, a little bit of a different, we're buying a law office, not a crack house on Capitol Hill, so it's not exactly the same story. And that's not even like I'm making a lawyer's joke. No, they, they've been phenomenal to, to work with. But as we're walking through, this is where God really began to accelerate things, giving us favor with lenders, favor with contractors, favor with two different townships. But that's not the craziest of it all. The, uh, the, uh, the, the first Sunday that I was able to make that, that public announcement, many of you were here, that public announcement of what we're doing, I think I got no more than three steps and that Sunday, we had a guest keyboard that says, hey, Dr. J, our church has been looking for a building, a campus for the, next, the past five years. And, and then God began to move. That next Saturday was a men's breakfast. I think I shared before. We had three different churches to come, some pastors and elders that came. Of course, they were there for the great fellowship of the men's breakfast, but they also wanted to kick the tires and, and look around the building and began to be meeting with other uh, church leaders and those from other nonprofits about, or God, what, what might you have for the next season for this campus? I know just over these past few months, I have met more pastors, I have met more ministry leaders than in our first year and a half or so here, and it's been great getting to meet so many of those that also have a burden for this community, praying through, God, what might you have for us? 
all the while, we have never listed this property. We've never had a for sale sign out front. But this is where we really need to buckle our seatbelts, right? Ready? I'm gonna, depending on what kind of buckle you might have, you know your own car, buckle your seatbelt. Because <laughs> God is honoring your faithfulness. We've had several good options we've been discussing with different uh, Primarily churches, but a few nonprofits as well. While I was in El Salvador, we had a special business meeting that was scheduled just for a few hours after our plane landed. We we're going to be meeting here Sunday, that, that very next Sunday. While we were gone, there was someone who had reached out. Uh, actually, the seller of the new campus uh, reached out to a church and kind of put them in contact uh, with with the church, and and they came and took, and they were they were interested in the building. And so now we began to scramble. Like we had announced a special business meeting for the purpose of uh, getting approval to be able to rent the building, but now at like the last minute there was this option of potentially selling the building. And so we're discussing like just procedurally, can we shift the purpose of the meeting and discuss? You know what? Let's best bet. Let's go ahead and postpone it, and let's spend some time in prayer. We gathered as a board on Zoom uh, later on in that week, <clears throat> kind of hearing some of these details really for the, the first time. I mean, I was uh, as we we're flying back from El Salvador, as we're connecting to the airports, I'm on the phone with uh, different leaders at our church and board members and trying to kind of get some of the pieces to, together, but sitting down and kind of walking it through. And, and at the end of it, I said, you know what? And, and it's what I said, like, we've been leading the congregation down this path like we've been talking about renting it out and leasing it out. We've been talking about this plan all along. Like this would be a deviation, a shift, a change from what we've been talking about. And 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 let's just let's just stay the course. Uh, and so we uh, kind of passed word on to the church that had offered to buy it, and just simply said, you know, we we appreciate the offer, um, but we're going to just stick with our plan. And they and they asked, hey, can we just at least get a meeting with with the leadership? And out of respect, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're right here in the same community and sat down and uh, the whole while we're just praying, God, guide us. God, direct us. And being able to, to, to sit down with them and uh, hearing what they had, it, it really, really began to connect some things. And as some of the board members are texting and emailing and we're talking, there just seemed to be some just genuine excitement that this is a, an answer to prayer that many of us, quite honestly, weren't even bold enough to be asking for, uh, for God to answer. We had had the, the campus appraised uh, earlier in the process. Somewhere around $600,000 or so was the appraised value of the building. Uh, and we got an offer uh, for over four $800,000 for the campus. Not only that, but eight hundred thousand. They're they're ready to close by Thanksgiving. We could stay in this campus until our renovations are complete at the new building, and we could stay here as long as we needed to complete the renovations rent free. And unlike with some of our rental options, where we need to leave the the church equipped, we can take everything with us: every chair, every TV, every technology, everything we bought. We get to take with us, and that really does add up and without even asking they submitted that in writing was just within a few hours of our sit down i tell you when, when god speaks as when we gathered at our board meeting like, it was hard to pass up on what we felt god was speaking to us and so that's why we have uh, our, our special meeting vote our special meeting scheduled. And, and I know as a church, as voting members, we still need to vote on this. We still need to pray. Uh, and as a church, come together as a unified voice to pray. But I absolutely believe that God moving is at least something that this morning we can at least, in a, a non-legally binding, uh, just show of appreciation and give God a hand for his moving in through this. Each step of the way, he just continues to humble us, just continues to bless us, and quite honestly, really stretch us through this. And not only are we, uh, are we excited about this, 
but on Friday night as people were coming through the doors, I mean, some of you who were downstairs by the photo booth, you were hearing people coming in, and like, hey, we hear that you're buying the Martin Harding Mazzotti building. That's so exciting. And while some of their kids were up here playing in that controlled chaos in the dark, some of their parents were over there looking at the blueprints, looking at the floor plans, looking at what God's vision is for our church. I gotta tell you, our community is getting excited. We're not even asking. We don't even have, like, we don't have a for sale sign. We don't have a, a coming soon sign over there yet. But God is spreading the word and God is doing some things, again, that many of us aren't even having the faith to be asking for. It really challenges me. Just what does God have planned? The, the details of the resolution is already posted on our church website on the membership section. I invite you to go ahead and take a look at that. Um, if you're having any troubles logging into it, just reach out to the church office. Likewise, if you need an absentee ballot, just reach out and contact the church office. Because here's the truth. Money is never the answer to problems. God is. You know, there's so, so, it's so often when we look at something and, and we try to solve it on our own, when God is saying, just trust me, don't doubt me. When I speak, all you need to do is to listen. All you need to do is to obediently follow me. This is why we have to be hearing from God. When you know this truth, when you believe this truth, when, when you're living it out, it will change everything about your life. Listen to these words of Christ. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Amen. It's right there in God's word. Jesus said it himself. Money is simply a test to see who has our hearts. Simple as that. It's true for our church. And it's true for our personal finances. Right, two quick scriptures this morning in our time. And then we're going to do something a little bit unique before we go. Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. These have been guiding words for my life. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, which lets me know if all that I have before me, if I can do it on my own, then I'm not pleasing God. This is literally what the Word of God is saying. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, which means we need to be living a life that requires faith faith in God, stepping out in opportunities to share the gospel, perhaps going on a missions trip, perhaps witnessing or praying for a co-worker. Maybe it was that missions pledge last Sunday. Maybe it's beginning or resuming being faithful with your tithe. Maybe it's trusting God with your future. your plans, your dreams. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. All right, I promise you two scriptures, one more. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because your heart follows your treasure. Where you put your treasure, your heart will follow. If you're keeping it close, if you're not living by faith, that's going to dictate your future. Say, God, no, I want to invest in the kingdom of God. Lord, I, I want to invest in reaching my community. God, I, I want to put my life 
my money, my time, my energy, and investing and making disciples and reaching our community, your heart will follow your treasure. Each of us has been given one life. We choose how to invest our time. This is the day you'll, you'll never get back. The decisions you make today will influence your future. Tomorrow you'll be given another day, another opportunity. And what you do with tomorrow will influence your future. You have a choice to lead your heart. You can take a step out in faith and say, God, I'm going to follow you. I don't see the whole staircase, but I'm going to take the next step. And for some of you, that this morning, it's as practical as tithing. And for some of you, it's something really challenging. So you're praying about your life, praying about your kids, praying about decisions. I'm going to ask our ushers to get ready with our communion elements this morning. And, and I know generally about once a month we partake of communion, but I think I was speaking some stuff to me this past week. We, we had this Sunday, a communion Sunday. We scheduled it out weeks, if not months ago. Long before we had the initial offer and the, and the written offer for this campus. But God beginning to, to speak some powerful things. And as the, the ushers attribute the elements here at Capital Church, we practice an open communion. And by that, we simply mean you don't need to be a member of this church to partake of communion, simply a member of the body of Christ. If you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we invite you to take the elements as they are handed out and hold on to them until all are served and we'll partake together. And when we think of communion, so often we go right back to, to the Last Supper, obviously, and we recognize that it goes back even further. It goes back to a time where God had given the Israelites their next steps. And they needed to choose to be obedient to God's instructions. If they want His protection, if they want His blessing, if they want to be in the center of his will, they would, need to have, they would need to obey what God was telling them to do. Quite honestly, they need to do it by faith. Go back and, and read the Passover story. It's nothing any of them had ever experienced before in slavery, captivity in Egypt. And God is saying, I'm going to set you free, but this is what you need to do. Fast forward, Jesus is there with his disciples. Again, they're remembering what had been done. Jesus is also speaking, I've got something new for you. And it's going to stretch your faith. It's not what you thought. It's not how you have understood it. And fast forwarding to today. God is still speaking those same words. Trust me. Obey me. Because I love you. And I've got great plans. Right now that my kids aren't in second service or serving and they're over in the building, I can say, hey, I didn't always obey my parents growing up. <laughs> and there are consequences for that. Kids haven't always obeyed us. And there are consequences. Not just dad's going to get mad or dad's going to discipline or dad's going to get angry. No, like there are things that happen in our lives when we step out of God's purpose and God's plans. I'm assuming you were chuckling because you didn't all obey your parents either. 
There are those times where you know what you're supposed to do because it's, it's pretty clear. We choose to do our own thing. We step out of the umbrella of God's blessing. Where we're going as a church, we can't afford to do it on our own. We can't afford to lean back on our own wisdom, our own cash in the bank and cash offers that are coming in and writing. If we just lean upon our own wisdom, we're not going to have the impact that God desires for this community. And Lord knows this community needs Jesus. Jesus needs you to open up your church on a Friday night and just invite people in and just to love on them. To open up your homes and just invite people around in small groups sharing the love of Jesus. Need you to be there in those relationships and offering a word of prayer, offering a meal, offering a cup of cold water or a cup in His, in his name. So this is communion. Scripture says, as often as you do this, do this remembrance of me. But I believe that this morning is so much more. It's not a legally binding vote. That's going to come up in another week or two. But this morning, covenanting with God. God, I want to hear your voice. I want to follow your plan. I want to be obedient to what you speak to me. Because Lord, I need your blessing. I need your blessing. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took that bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. God sent his one and only son to walk upon this earth for you. Not for what you could give or what someday what you could do, but because he loved you. As we looked at the other day, he loved you first. You can't earn it. You certainly didn't deserve it. He loved you anyway. And Heavenly Father, Lord, as we hold this symbol of your broken body, Lord, I thank you for that great love. Lord, you met us right where we were at, and you loved us, and you accepted us, and you held us close. Lord, may we have the faith to do likewise. We partake of the symbol of your broken body. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. As many of us here are aware, this symbolizes the shed blood that was poured out on Calvary. Scripture tells us that his blood washes us whiter than snow. There's power, power, wonder-working power in his blood. There are things that God desires to do that are illogical. They're miraculous. And the miraculous, by definition, requires us to be beyond our own ability. It's the only way to please him. We're talking on Monday night about some of these decisions we have coming up, and somebody reminded us, well, we don't do it to, to please people because you can't please everyone. No. We do all that we do to please one, for the audience of one. In order to please God, we have to live by faith. 
So, Heavenly Father, Lord God, in this sacred moment, not just another Sunday, not just another cup, not just another communion service, but, Lord God, a pivotal moment in our life, Lord, where we covenant with you that we want your will for our lives. God, even as your son, as he held that cup, prayed, if it's your will, take it from him. Lord, we hold this cup within our hands. We say, Lord God, if, if what we have of force is not your will, take it from us. But Lord, if it be your will, may we obediently follow the steps for our marriages, for our homes, for our families, for our finances, and for our church. So we pray this as we partake of the symbol of your son's body. Church, I'm going to invite you to stand with me here. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come and join us at the altar, our pastors and elders and deacons and their spouses. It's just something that God's been speaking to you this morning, and, and you would just appreciate just a, a moment of prayer, someone to agree with you in prayer for whatever that might be. Or maybe you're here and you just, you just need a touch from the Lord as we worship Him together. I invite you to come and take a step of faith. Take a step for prayer. So church this morning, as we worship him, I invite you to come and let us pray. sins offered me, my future is here, and I praise God for what he's done. Sing for the freedom he has won, even death is dead and done, his life is overcome. Say the name, speak, say the name above all names, over every broken place. He is risen from the grave, what he's done, oh, oh what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven. My future is here. I praise God. 